This week is our final part in our Bible series about the Bible. Have we learned a few things so far? Awesome. Today, how to read the Bible. How many of you enjoy reading the Bible? Awesome. Me too. How many of you read the Bible? <laughs> oh, look, the same hands. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> How many of you have never read the Bible? All right, a few. There we go. I've had many people say to me, I've read the Bible from cover to cover. Really? Wow, that's impressive, I suppose. However, the Bible was never meant to be read from cover to cover. You see, it's not a novel or an academic thesis. As we have been discussing over the last few weeks, it is a collection of books, a collection of writings consisting of various genres. We believe that the books were written by people who were inspired by God to communicate a truth, to record a history, to correct a misunderstanding. And we looked at the nature of inspiration at the beginning of the series, then looked at the historical reliability of the text, then canonicity last week, why these books were chosen and others weren't. How many were so surprised to see how many other books there were circulating at the time? Hey, remember that slide? A lot of books, wasn't it? We also looked at the vast amount of literature produced around the time of the writers and saw just how much literature was out there masquerading as authentic. And all this to build our confidence in this book we call the Bible. Confidence in the historical reliability of its message. So today, in the last part of our Bible series, we are looking at how we appropriate the biblical writings. How do we interpret and apply them to our lives today? This is the whole purpose of having such a historical record, to apply it to our lives today. Otherwise, everything would just be an interesting history lesson, which isn't bad. I like history lessons. <laughs> the Bible. The Bible used to be very mysterious. It was a very mysterious book to me. See, I knew a few stories contained in it from Sunday school at the Anglican church that my parents took my sister and I when we were kids for a few years. I knew about David and Goliath, Noah and the Ark, Moses and the Ten Commandments, Adam and Eve and the Apple. I knew about Jesus who died on the cross. I even knew the story, how he called all the little children to him. But I had never read the Bible. After our family had left the church and stopped going altogether, the Bible never crossed my mind. I was too busy playing hockey, playing music, chasing girls. I got one, actually. <laughs> what good was the Bible anyway? Science was the only real thing of value in our world, I thought. Look what science does for humanity. Cars, phones, computers, planes, medicine, things that really help humanity. Religion? Well, I always thought the world would be a better place without religion. Look at all the trouble that it causes. It's not that I didn't believe that there was a God. I did. I just didn't believe he had anything to do with what I saw going on in religion. I believed there was a God, but... Everything about that was irrelevant. It had no impact on my life. It made no difference to my life or to those around me, as far as I thought. Then I had an experience with Jesus. It wasn't long after that experience that I started reading the Bible. And you know what I discovered? Many people had the same experiences back then as I did. And all of a sudden, the Bible became relevant it not only recorded authentic experiences of people connecting with God, it contained guidance on how to do exactly that, how to connect with God. And this began a fascination for me to discover and understand what was written in the Bible. I didn't believe it was God's word at the time, but I did recognize the authenticity of what was written relative to my experiences. Something had happened to me 
and something had happened to them, and it's connected. I thought I would do as most people do, read the Bible from cover to cover. So I opened the book to Genesis. Genesis, I thought for a moment. I didn't realize Phil Collins was a Christian. Yes, I was that ignorant of the Bible. And it's funny because it's true. That's exactly what I thought. <laughs> I always thought that there were books called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but I couldn't find them. <laughs> I didn't realize they were way in the back. I had a lot to learn about the Bible and how to read it. And today is an overview of just that. So let's start with some of the basics. Number one, Phil Collins did not write Genesis. <laughs> but the Bible itself is one book comprised of how many books? 66. 66 individual books. And these books are divided into sections, the Old and the New Testament. There are 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New. Thank you for adding that slide. Perfect. The Old Testament is divided as such. You can see up here. Starting over there, we have the Pentateuch. And as the name suggests, these are the first five books of the Bible. They're also known as the Book of of Moses, or known as the Torah. The Pentateuch consists of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then next are the historical books. And these books contain the history of Israel, and there are 12. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Then there is the poetry and wisdom literature, which includes Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Songs of Solomon. Closing off the Old Testament is the Book of the Prophets. There are five major and twelve minor. The majors are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And the minor is Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Come on, doesn't that deserve a hand? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I saw you start, Jenna. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, I practiced that. There is one apocalyptic book. Oh, no, wait, I skipped. Hold on a second. Go back to the Old Testament. And then there are all of the um, minor prophets. So the New Testament, it starts with the Gospels, records of Jesus' life and teaching, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There is one historical book in the New Testament, which is Acts, and the next group of writings are the epistles, the letters. The epistles are divided into two categories. First, the Pauline epistles, which, as the name suggests, were written by Paul. Uh, the Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. The second group are the general epistles, which are Hebrews, and Hebrews was written specifically to Jewish Christians, and then the rest of the general epistles were written to Christians in general, which are James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, and Jude. There is one apocalyptic book included in the Bible, which is the book of Revelations. So then what do we do with all of this literature? Hmm? What do we do with all of this? It's one thing to recognize that some of these people have had the same experiences as us, but is that all that we do with it? Many of us recognize there's a lot of great advice in the Bible as to how we ought to live our lives, how we ought to treat each other, value guidance on valuable guidance on ethics and morality, yet it even goes deeper. It gives us insight into spiritual realities and reveals what is possible, such as spiritual gifts, and most of all, salvation, a reconnection with God. And the real value comes when we understand what it means and how we apply it to our lives. We discover this every Sunday as we gather together. We look at a passage in the Bible, understand it, and then apply it to our lives. This is the science of hermeneutics the branch of knowledge that deals with interpretation, 
especially of the Bible or literary texts. None of us approach literature with a blank slate, do we? Hmm? None of us. We even categorize the books by their literature. None of us approach literature with a blank slate. Even before we crack the cover of a book, we have expectations and a framework through which we will interpret the words on the page. For example, when we go to chapters, all the literature is categorized by genre, right? There's fiction, science fiction, fantasy, nonfiction, biography, autobiography, history, science, political science, culture, religion, self-help, diet, exercise, cooking, home improvement, business, leadership, magazines, manga, poetry. I go to chapters a lot, you can tell. <laughs> And even before we pick up a book, we have an expectation of what's inside. And we have already put on our interpretive lenses, even before we pick up the book, to properly interpret it. When I pick up an autobiographical book, I already know it's a real person writing about their life. Therefore, the times and places should match the time period of their life. I'm already approaching the book with an interpretive lens. There are natural expectations we have of the text based on the genre, and we do this with the Bible. If the Gospels and letters were truly written as life accounts of these people and those they were writing to, we expect the names and the places to be real, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, time and time again. Archaeological evidence shows the veracity of the historical text. Cross-referencing other historical texts again verifies the Gospels, Acts, and Epistles. And when I pick up a science fiction book like Star Wars, I don't expect to meet Yoda downtown for a drink on the patio, right? I may think I've met Yoda after too many drinks on a patio, <laughs> But you, not that that would ever happen. <laughs> but you get the point. We don't read science fiction thinking that people and places are real. We know what's fiction and what is not. When we approach the Bible, we need to do the same thing. Recognize the genre first in order to start with the right interpretive lens. There are many different types of literature in the Bible. Hmm? And determining what type of literature is in each section is very, very important. This is called form criticism. And form criticism answers that question, what literary form is this? The Bible consists of history, biography, poetry, wisdom literature, fiction, prophetic literature, apocalyptic literature, law, metaphors, hyperbole, similes, anecdotes, narrative, myth. In order to properly understand the message, requires that we understand what type of literature we are reading. We don't approach the Gospels as poetry. They may contain poetry, but we understand the place of poetry within the larger literary work. And neither do we approach the Psalms as history. Although there may be historical elements within the Psalms, we understand it within the larger literary genre of poetry. And when we approach any historical text, we must understand the genre. So, here we are, ready to pick up the Bible and read it. We pick it up knowing Phil Collins didn't name his band after the first book of the Bible, although it's a cool thought. And we begin reading. Here are a few things to keep in mind when interpreting the Bible. Number one, we have a list of them here as well. We are separated from the text by time, culture, and language. We have that list. Oh, next one. I know it's in there somewhere. There we are. All right, so these are things to keep in mind when you read the Bible. Number one, we are separated from the text by time, culture, and and language. Number two, if we want to understand what it means to us today, 
we must first understand what it meant to them. Point number three. A text cannot mean what it never could have meant to its author or their readers. And number four, whenever we share comparable particulars, similar life situations, the message to us is the same as it is to them. Now, we'll go through these points and explain them a little bit clearer. First of all, we are separated from the texts by time, culture, and language. See, when we read our Bibles, we are reading them in English, or most of us, I suppose. I know that if uh, Esther and Simon were here, they'd say they read it in Frisian, because they've told me they do. <laughs> but for most of us, we read it in English. As we all know, the Bible wasn't written in English. It was originally written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And no matter how hard one tries, something will always be lost in translation. Always. And many of you have asked me, which is the best English translation? And the answer is, well, what kind of translation are you looking for? There are word-for-word -word translations, there are paraphrases, and everything in between, as you can see on the chart. So there are three different, three different charts here. You just pull them off the internet anywhere, and they, they categorize all of the English Bibles relatively close, about the same. On, on, this, on your left, we have word-for-word, word-for-word, -word, word and word-for-word -word translations right down there. So when you see that word interlinear, what that means is, remember that Greek text that I brought two weeks ago, and you look through and you can see all the variants? It's that Greek text with the English word underneath each Greek word. That's interlinear. Right? I, I should have brought. I have one of those. I should have brought it. We'll do it another time. But that's interlinear. Very, very difficult to read uh, because in English the meaning is ordered by uh, the meaning comes from the order of the words in our language, whereas not in Greek so much. Right? So it's difficult to read. So we don't tend to read interlinear books. But that is like as close as you'll get to the original. The next, of course, is word for word. So they're trying to get it as close to that text as possible. Uh, so you have your New American Standard Bible, etc., and so on. The King James Version falls in there, which is a Revised Standard Version. I'm looking at the middle chart here. New King James Version, right? So they're pretty close to word for words. But if you move over to the right, kind of in the middle, is the New International Version. So this is, this is kind of moving more towards thought for thought, right? Which, which is great. There's nothing right or wrong about that because we're moving from one language into another. And the reality is you can't translate some things word for word because there are some words that just don't exist in English that exist in the Greek and vice versa. So there's nothing right or wrong about thought for thought, right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's just fine. So it's, it's personal choice. And then you move more over to the right for the thought. New Living Translation, they're kind of in, in the, under the H of thought. That's one of my favorite translations, actually, the New Living Translation. Uh, I love the way it reads. That's, that's the version that I use for my personal Bible reading. I just like the way it flows and the way that it, that, that it reads. Um, and, but, okay, one thing when you're reading things like NIV and New Living Translation, pay attention to the footnotes, right? They have the little footnotes there. Pay attention to those. Like, read them. They're very interesting. Uh, and then all the way over to the message. You see the message there on the far right side? Personally, I, I don't like the message. <laughs> I don't. I know it's, it's, it's very poetic, and, and it flows nice, and you know, I, I know a number of people who really do like that translation. Personally, I don't. And one of the reasons why I personally don't is some of the passages that I read, I'm like, that's not what it means. I think that the, it's not just a, it's, it's a thought for their own thoughts. It's not thought for thought anymore. It just goes way too far. So when you're reading a uh, like a paraphrase translation, you know, a general thought. Remember that whoever is writing that, that's how they think it is. Those are their thoughts. So you have to be aware of which translation. It's not that, 
you can read them, they're fine, but we need to be aware of what type of English Bible we are reading. So I hope that that helps. And just like going to the bookstore and knowing you're reading fiction or nonfiction, it's important to know what kind of translation you are reading. So your expectations are accurate. Here's what Raymond Brown, in an introduction to the New Testament, says about hermeneutics. He says, even the most competent English translation cannot render all the nuances of the original Greek. From the viewpoint of culture and context, the authors and their audiences had a worldview very different from ours. Different background, different knowledge, different suppositions about reality. We cannot hope to open a New Testament book and read it responsibly with the same ease as we read a book written in our own culture and worldview. Consequently, an intelligent effort to understand the background and outlook of the authors can be of great assistance. So this leads us to the second point on understanding the Bible. If we want to understand what it means to us today, we must first understand what it meant to them. The next slide, I think, maybe has that. Yes, there we are. So now we're moving on to point two. If we want to understand what it means to us today, we must first understand what it meant to them. Hmm. Does that make sense? Sure it does. So we recognize that we are separated by time, culture, and language, and therefore we need to understand their setting. This involves historical research. Understanding the culture, the historical context of the passage. We do that a lot in Peterborough City Church. And now you know why, <laughs> right? Now you know why. It is essential to understanding the text. How many of you have read something in the Bible and thought, I don't get it? <laughs> of course, we all do, right? Of course. Sure we do. I don't get it. We all have. That's because we are 21st century Canadians reading 1st century and older Far East literature from another language. <laughs> Those are quite the barriers to bring down in order to understand them. There will be lots of things that sound confusing, lots of things that we will not understand without doing proper research and study. And one of the biggest mistakes made in hermeneutics the science of interpretation, one of the biggest mistakes is creating a meaning to fill the void of incomprehension, right? I don't understand it. So then, well, I think it means this, right? I mean, we all kind of do that, right? When we read something, we don't really understand what it says. We guess, or we think, well, maybe it means this. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you go somewhere to find out what the real answers are, right? Like, that's, that's very important. People create meaning because they don't understand it. And instead of doing the proper research to understand what the text means, they simply decide for themselves and say, oh, this is what it means to me. And although application may be somewhat subjective, interpretation is not. And this is why we need theological dictionaries, commentators, language studies, historical books, in order to bridge that gap between the time, language, and culture. So this leads us to the third point on interpretation. A text cannot mean what it never could have meant to its author or their readers, right? So first, oh, if we could stay there, yep. So we are separated by the time and text, culture, language, so we need to understand what it meant to them first, and then the text cannot mean what it never could have meant to its authors and readers. We will explain. For example, John writes at the end of the book of Revelation in 22.18, it says, I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophecy in this book, if anyone adds to anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. All right, what does he mean? Does he mean the book of Revelation, or does he mean the Bible? Anybody? Revelation. Some people think it's the Bible. I've heard so many people say it's the Bible. But it's the book of Revelation. It's the book of Revelation. Why? 
Exactly. The Bible wasn't around then. It can't be the Bible because there was no Bible when he wrote that, right? A text cannot mean what it never could have meant to its author or their readers, right? This is the approach. So clearly he meant the book of Revelation. But so many times in our churches, we tell, we say that it's the Bible, right? You hear that so many times. But really, it's not that difficult. No, there was no Bible, so it's the book of Revelation. So remember, we are separated by time and culture. If you want to understand, and if we could go back one more, church, one more time to that slide before, perfect. And no, number four, whenever we share comparable particulars, similar life situations, the message to us is the same as it is to them. What does that mean? For example, when the Bible says, all have sinned, and by grace you are saved through faith, it is true for us, just as it was true for them. That's what it means. Uh, also, uh, for example, when the Bible says uh, you should have compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience in Colossians 3, it means the same thing for us today as it did for them. So whenever we share comparable particulars, similar life situations, the message to us is the same for them. So these are some of the key principles just to keep in mind when reading the Bible. Does that help a little bit? All right. Now, some of you may be casual readers and look to someone else to do the deeper digging in the Bible. And that's okay. Why? Because we only have so much time in our week. And others may want to dig a little deeper into the text. So here's a quick process by which, both pers which can be both personally enriching and educative on how to read the Bible. If we want to dig deeper on our own, here's a process to help you on your way. First thing you do is you grab a notepad and a pen. Right? Then you read your passage of interest. As you read your passage of interest, write down your thoughts, how it makes you feel, what you like, what you don't like, what you don't understand. Write down your questions. List all your questions. Key words that jump out in the passage. Just write them down in a big collage. There's no right and wrong here. Just put all your thoughts down on a piece of paper. What jumps out as you read the passage? Next, grab a different English translation and read it again. Yeah, if you don't have various English translations, there are lots of them online. Uh, one of my favorites is a website, BibleGateway.com. They have every English version on there you can think of. It's fabulous. So read it in a couple of different English languages if you want to really understand that passage. And as you read it in another English translation, do the same process. You write down all your questions. You may have new ones after reading a different translation. Uh, do you remember when we did uh, Romans chapter 3 and we were talking about sin? Well, in some English translations, they have different words there for sin. And in some English translations, they just translate it sin. Interesting, isn't it? So you find out these things. Well, why is this English translation translating it this way? Why is this English translation translating it this way? Maybe we should do a word study, uh -huh, right? So these are some of the key things that you start to jot down uh, when understanding your Bible. Uh, there's no right and wrong. You just put your thoughts again on paper. Don't worry about finding the answers yet. Uh, and don't worry about, again, being right or wrong. The answers will come as you go walk through the process. So you write down how you think all of these things apply to your life. And just write down your thoughts, what you think. Don't be afraid that you might be right or wrong because you'll get some correction. Don't be afraid of correction either. Don't be afraid to later go, oops, <laughs> boy, was I wrong on that one. <laughs> right? And that's okay because remember, it's a whole time and culture that we're bridging that gap. Right? So... On one hand, you could be right, right? Oh, look, I was right. And this could boost your confidence in understanding the historical text. But the more you do this, the more accurate you will become as you learn the historical nature of the text. So then once you've done all that, you start your word studies. You know all those key words that you picked out in the text, the ones that jumped out? Do they really mean what you think they mean? Hmm. For example... When Jesus accuses the Pharisees and the religious leaders of being hypocrites, the word in English for hypocrite does not have the same meaning as the word hypocrite 
in Koine Greek. <laughs> it has changed. Ooh. So this is why you need to do some word studies. Or this is why some passages may sound confusing when you read them. Right? So don't, don't, don't feel bad if you read it and go, I don't get it. Right? It's okay. Just let it sit for a while or call your pastor and, and uh, he'll help you out, I'm sure. So then, uh, after the word studies, you go back and you say, do I understand the text better? Does this give me a new application? Do I have a further understanding? Write down your new thoughts. What do you think the text means now? Does it change your application? Does it add to it? So now that you've done all of that work, then you go to the commentaries, and you take a look, and you see, well, what? What are they saying about this passage? There are many different types of commentaries. There are exegetical, there are expositional, there are multi-volume, multi-author, single author, single volume, etc., and so on. These tell us the cultural background. They go into some word studies, some of them if they're really good. They get into the language nuances in the text. And once you have reviewed a number of commentaries, some are better than others, you will have a good grasp of the text. The reality is, not many of us have the resources to do this. We don't have the time it takes to do this properly, or the books. And this may sound a bit overwhelming, but I'm not expecting you to go out and buy commentaries and theological dictionaries. That's my job as the pastor, to do that digging and bring it to you on Sundays. But it's good for you to understand that process. Why there's all this information in the messages on Sundays. And although you may not have such resources, it lets you know that there are answers to your questions. It's okay to read and go, I don't get this. I don't understand this. That's okay. There are answers out there. This should not stop us from reading the Bible because we don't understand something. It's okay to have questions. You'll find the answers eventually, but you won't have any questions unless you're reading, right? Which brings us to the very last point on how to read the Bible. We're almost done. Where does one start when they read the Bible? It's so diverse. It's, well, big. It's important to have a broad understanding of the Bible, to see the common threads woven between the books. So, some people start at the beginning and read through it. Others start at the New Testament. Wherever you start, it's just great that you're reading it. Now, there is a great Bible reading system, as you can see on the screen, that was given to me shortly after I became a Christian. And I thought it appropriate to end with this in case you are struggling, struggling with where to start reading or have started and stalled. So, this is a Bible reading system. I, I love this. It's fantastic. And if you want, I can send you copies to it later, uh, copies to you. I was going to print some off this morning, but I ran out of time. <laughs> so, if you're interested, you let me know. Here's how the system works, all right? There are 10 categories. Nine of them, the Bible is divided into nine sections. So all the books of the Bible are divided into nine sections. You read one chapter from each section a day. Okay? So, on day one, you read Matthew chapter one. Genesis chapter one. Romans chapter one. First Thessalonians one. Job one. Psalms one. Proverbs one. Joshua one. Isaiah one. And then the next day... I'll explain 10 in a minute. Then the next day you read Matthew chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, Job 2, Psalms 2, Proverbs 2, Joshua 2, Isaiah 2. Day 3, what do you read? Matthew 3, right? Genesis 3, and so on. Now, when you get to the end of Matthew, you continue on to Mark. When you get to the end of Mark, you read Luke. John, when you get to the end of Acts, you go back to Matthew. All right? Did you get that? Do, do you understand that? So when you get to the end of Acts, so you read the last chapter in Acts, then the next day you read Matthew chapter 1 again, right? So you don't mix the columns. They stay where they are. 
So when you finish the book of Genesis, you read Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. When you finish Deuteronomy, you'll go back to Genesis chapter 1 and you continue that column, right? Okay, now, as you are reading the Bible, you will notice certain scriptures that will jump out at you. Certain passages will catch your attention. Write them down. Jot them down. Oh, this one really helps me. Oh, this one really comforted me. Oh, this is very interesting. Oh, I like that one. Just write them down. This one's very helpful. And those go in column number 10. Those go in your special scripture chosen by you. So then at the end of each day, when you've finished reading your nine chapters, just review all those special scriptures that jumped out at you. You get this wonderful little collection of Bible passages that are great for prayer time. They're great. Sometimes I am at a loss of words to pray. I don't know what to pray. I don't feel like praying. I'll pull out that list and I'll just read them. And then prayers just kind of fall out from them. So that, that number 10 column is just for you. That's your list. Now, each day it's very important to write down where you've left off because you'll get lost. At the very bottom here, this is actually, it, so I have a little piece of paper in the front of my Bible and it has you know, the 10 columns on it there and underneath I just have you know, Matthew 1 and Genesis 1. So I read that first line there. Then the next day I just write, okay, Matthew 2 and then Genesis 2 as I read along, right? So I can keep track of where I am as I'm going in my Bible. And I'm going, oh, here's my little piece of paper. I just write down what I'm reading next, and then I read it. The other thing is, I'll be in the book of Kings, let's say, and I'm reading a really interesting story. So I want to keep reading. So I read four or five chapters instead. Well, I write that down, <laughs> right, where I ended off. And by the time I finish those chapters, I'm like, well, I don't feel like reading the rest. I've read enough. And that's fine. But I know where I've left off on each thing. This Bible reading system is fantastic because you get a broad understanding of the Bible. You are reading Gospels, Epistles, Old Testament history, Pentateuch, poetry, wisdom literature. You're, you're getting the full vi vision of the Bible and how it kind of fits together. Anyway, I highly recommend this, so I thought I would bring it today. Uh, for those who are interested, uh, I can email it to you, or you can actually just download the message. It has it in the PDF file right there. So, uh, all right, I think that's everything. <laughs> just <laughs> I'm pull back to my text here and see where I left off. So I hope this series on the Bible has inspired you to trust and to read it. It doesn't mean anyone has it all figured out, but there certainly is a lot that has been. Amen.